Hi guys, and welcome to our video Bible study for Wells Tucson Campus Ministry. I'll be your host in this Bible study. My name is Campus Pastor Tim Patoka. Pastor is easy enough. Happy to have you join us as we continue our mini unit called God's Guidance for Loving Our Neighbor. And we look specifically at how it is that we might say no in love, but so that we may show love to our neighbor. Because this is a video version of the Bible study, I'll be encouraging you from time to time to, to pause the video and to think of some answers that I'll be, uh, in, uh, um, that I'll be asking you. Um, if you want to write down those answers, you're very welcome to. That might help you get some of your thoughts out. Um, but definitely want to uh, take a moment to pause so you can participate in this study. Um, and as well as I'll be able to share with us some of the things we learned from our Bible study, the in-person study last night on Sunday, October 11th. Um, as I'll mention at the end of this video, you are welcome to contact me. Easiest way is on our campus ministry website, wellstcm.com, and you'll see on there a lot of information um, that I'll be referring to at the end of this video. However, before we get started into our, our Bible study for this time, I do wanna ask you this question. What's the time when someone said no to you and it was for your good? Take a moment and pause the video and think of a time when someone said no to you in love so that they may show their love to you. Some of the answers that we had from our students who were at the in-person Bible study were thinking back to when they were growing up as kids, when their parents said that they shouldn't run out into the street because if doing so is not good at all. Indeed, that was a very loving thing to do was to say no to them. Or another one was um, when it comes to the setting of bedtime and the need to uh, get enough sleep before you go to school the next day. Uh, one person in particular decided to flout that rule and to stay up as long as they wanted and meant that the next day they were falling asleep in class and that was not good for them at all. I'm sure you can think of times as well as I have think of times when people have said no to us and ended up being for our good. However, we did not like hearing that no answer and very likely we did not necessarily understand it at the time either. However, thankfully people who said no to us, so they could take care of us and to give us what we truly needed or to help us um, grow up into the people that we are now. And when we talk about this idea of say no, another term can also be used as the idea of tough love. While we won't speak, be speaking specifically about tough love, you'll see ideas how this um, concept comes across. We see how does that God himself sometimes says no to us when we wish that he would say yes. However, there's reasons why God says no, reasons that we'll delve into in this Bible study, but also, too, reasons that we'll see for ourselves as we see how it is we can say no to our neighbor so as to best love them as well. With that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. So get ready to begin our Bible study and to see what God's word has to say about this subject. Go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we ask you to be with us and to help us marvel at your love, a love that does what is best for us, even if that includes saying no to us from time to time. Help us, Lord, to, um, to understand and to be patient with your answers to us, but also, too, to uh, work in us a heart, a heart that may say no to our neighbors around us when we need to do so for their good so that they may show, so they may receive our love for them. We ask this in your name, amen. One thing I would like you to do is, what would you think about this statement here? Uh, I use the Mentimeter platform. I'll be sharing the results in the next slide in this, in this video here. Um, but what is your take on the statement that I have in the top right there of, of the video here? Love for another is best shown in what you do for them. You have three options. You have option one, you agree with it. Option two, you disagree with it. Then option three, it depends. Take a moment, pause the video, and would you agree or disagree with this phrase here? Our class last night was evenly split across two answers. Here you see the results that we came up with. Of the six people who took the uh, who took the 
the, the quiz, there are three who said that they agree. And very much saying that when it comes to words or actions, it's actions that speak the loudest. And love for another is best shown in what you do, that is in the actions, not just simply what you say to them or what you are promising to do, but what you actually do. There were a number, as you see, that did the middle column, that the it depends. And this idea is sometimes um, there's words that you need to speak, um, but action not, not always being, being received, or perhaps it depends on the person. We are not able to give them an action uh, that shows them their love, but rather just being there for them, whether it's just uh, speaking to them or having that kind heart, or perhaps um, sharing words in a letter or in a card or in an email, uh, still words that can live on much longer than what a one-time action would be. And this is very, very clearly how we typically think of love, is what we do for another person and what we say yes to them in. However, there are times when we can see how sometimes love is best shown in what we do not do for them with that disagree column, which nobody went for, which is okay. But sometimes what we don't do for a person shows that best case of love for another person. And what we're going to be doing is seeing there are four reasons why God will say no to us, what he will purposely not do in order to show his love for us. The first one is one that comes across, we see in Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12, where it speaks about uh, for godly reasons why, why people say no. Proverbs 3, verse 11 begins, Do not reject the Lord's discipline, my son, and do not despise his warning, because the Lord warns the one he loves as a father, warns a son with whom he is well pleased. When we typically think of someone saying no to us in love, we think of the family construct of the, of the home of, of, of our parents who need to say no to us in order to help us for the end. Uh, you can think of an example yourself. Maybe you want to do something as a kid, but your parents said no. You may not have liked it, but it was for your good. And this is a very key area when it comes to this idea of what we think of people saying no to us. However, what I find interesting is that we have these two verses being cited in the New Testament with some additional explain, um, commentary, some additional explanation. So it's found in Hebrews 12, verses 7 through 8, and then verse 11. And keep in mind, the Proverbs passage, which is these verses here, come immediately before what we pick it up in Hebrews 12. Beginning at verse 7, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. Is there a son whose father does not discipline him? If you are not disciplined, and all of us have received it, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. No discipline seems pleasant when it's happening, but painful. Yet later it yields a peaceful harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. We see the uh, New Testament writer to Hebrews giving further explanation when it comes to drawing the connection between God saying no to us when it comes to the idea of discipline. And as a ideal parent uh, figure, whether it's a father or a mother, they are expected, they will need to discipline their kids. Now, of course, we do not live in a perfect world. We live in a sinful world where there are fractured families and there are less than ideal parents or perhaps parents who are not even in the picture. And sometimes, uh, those who have been trusted to raising up a young one in God's good way may fail to see what discipline is, but sometimes they may do punishment. One key way of describing between punishment and discipline is why is it happening? Why is a child receiving whatever the consequence is? Punishment is typically done because it's wishing to do evil to another or to get back at somebody. Um, it comes from a sinful driven emotion. And even if it is logical and if it makes one person feel good, punishing is meant to inflict pain on another person so that you feel better about it. And definitely that is not what we want happening in a parent-child relationship or really in any kind of relationship. Rather, discipline, however, is it uses the consequence for the recipient's good. Think of a child who has uh, run out into the streets and they need to be told that that is not acceptable behavior, not simply because they went against their parents' word, 
but it's very dangerous for their health and they could possibly be hit by a car. And that's the last thing anyone wants. And so if a child runs out into the road against the parent's clear instruction, the parent needs to discipline them. How that might be the case, that will be for a parenting class and depending on the parent and on the child, how that discipline will be. But whatever the consequence is, it's meant to teach the child not to go out onto the street not to put their life in danger and hopefully they'll listen to that lesson without having to pay the price of not listening to that lesson when it comes to us and god many times we see that god will use suffering as discipline as a way of correcting false behavior or bringing our sights on something else so that we come out better for it in the end and this is what we should expect from our god as his children through faith however that doesn't mean that discipline is easy you see there in verse 11, this discipline is not pleasant when it's happening. Rather, it's very painful. However, those who are raised up by it, indeed, do come out much better for it in the end. And when we look at what are God's reasons for saying no to us, one very key one is discipline. Sometimes he will say no. No, you cannot do that. No, you will not have this because it is for your good. And hopefully, as Bible-believing Christians, we will listen to God's word and trust in his, uh, in his answer, even if we don't necessarily understand how that is the case. However, there's another time when God will say no to us, and this comes to the topic of prayer. We see this mentioned in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And it goes on from there with some ideas of who we should include in our prayers, including our earthly rulers. We know that prayer is a very special gift that God has given to us. And we think of prayer, think of it as a conversation. A conversation where we speak to God with whatever is on our heart or on our mind. That can be done in a very formal setting, like we often do in worship services where we fold our hands and perhaps follow words that are printed out in a worship folder. It can also be done in a very informal way where it's you by yourself, whether it's before you go to bed and you are thinking thoughts and you're speaking to God with, 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 with your thoughts. Or as you're on your way to somewhere and you do a quick prayer of thanksgiving or asking for something or just want to talk to your father in heaven. It's a conversation where we speak to God with our words where in one where he speaks to us in his word. And this is where prayer is a little bit different than us speaking to one another. When I speak to a person, they can respond to me in real time and communication with whatever words are on their minds. And if they don't speak to me with their words, I'm left guessing what's going on. God, however, has problems to speak to us in his word. That is the Bible. And it's in this Bible, we have all of his words, all of his guidance, all that we need to know for salvation and so much more. And it's in here that we look first of all to see what is God's answer to our prayer. He has not promised to speak to us outside of the Bible. And you can think of examples or you can see ones on the internet where there are people who, who look for God's voice outside of the Bible. And very often they come to conclusions or ideas that go against what the Bible says. And it becomes clear that this is not the same person speaking. The one who speaks through the Bible is not the one that is supposedly speaking to this other person. And so when we go to God in prayer, we listen to him as he's spoken to us in his word. And when we look at what God's answers to our prayers may be, we oftentimes are asking for something. And so there's three answers that God can give to us in our prayers. And this is kind of spanning the whole realm of possibility, what you could possibly say to a prayer. There's the answer of yes where if we ask for something that God has already promised, certainly we know that he will say yes. If we ask God to forgive us or to strengthen our faith or to be with us or to watch over us or to do what is best according to his will, God says yes, because he's already promised to do that. We know that he will do these things. Another answer that God can give to our prayers is that of no. If we ask for sinful things, God will certainly say no to them because he does not want us to go into sin and certainly would not enable those sinful actions. Or maybe if we ask for something that God has decided that it is not for our good, he will say no to it. Um, and that we'll just have to figure out later on uh, that the answer was no at the end. 
The last answer that God can give is the one that kind of straddles the fence, the one that's between the two, the, the maybe later. This is the one where God doesn't necessarily give a yes or no answer, but kind of, uh, as we would say, he tables it. That is, he comes back to it later on. With a yes or no later on, we'll find out. And to give us an example of where we see God's answer to a prayer, what I want you to do is to look up these passages here in Genesis 18 and then Genesis 19. And to give you a little bit of context, what's going on here, we have Abraham, who lived around 2000 BC, a very strong believer, was uh, chosen, was called by God to come to the land of Israel and to set in place where the, the, the Israelite people would live one day. And next to where Abraham was living in the countryside were these two cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities that were very, very wicked, that showed it time and time again that they did not love their neighbor as themselves, that they rejected God's word, and they took advantage of people wherever they could. And God's patience finally ran out for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's going to destroy the cities entirely. However, before he did that, he gave knowledge to Abraham of what he was going to do. And Abraham is, has a personal interest in this because his nephew Lot, his wife and her and their, their two daughters, a family of four, were in Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham knew that if Sodom and Gomorrah were going to be destroyed without a single warning, well then Lot and his family, the, that uh, family of four who were believers in God, would perish as well. And so what I want you to do is to read Genesis 18 and to see what was Abraham's prayer to God and what was God's answer to that. And then skip ahead to ver chapter 19 to verses 21 through 29 and to see the conclusion of what happened in light of Abraham's prayer to God. And as you do all those things, answer these two questions. What was God's answer to Abraham's prayer? And secondly, how did God show his love for him through that answer? Let's go ahead, pause the video as you think of your answers and perhaps you want to write them down so that you don't lose track of them. As you heard with Abraham's prayer to God, it started off as if there are 50 righteous people that you'll save the whole city and God says yes. And Abraham realizes, well, maybe there's not going to be 50. So he knocks the number down by a little bit. God says yes again. Knocks it down some more. Keeps on going all the way down until there are only 10 righteous people in this very large city uh, that would have been very large for its time. And what was God's answer to Abraham's prayer? Well, technically it was yes. God said that if there are at least 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, that he would not destroy the cities. So God's answer is yes. However, when you look at what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, it seemed like the answer was no, because God ended up destroying those two cities, and Abraham very likely wondering, um, were there really less than 10 people who were righteous in that whole town? Or maybe um, God did not have mercy on them, or did not have a change of heart, change of mind after what he decided to do. But when you see in the conclusion there, we see Lot and his family being rescued. In the intervening verses between where you stopped in chapter 18 and we picked it up in chapter 19, you have the two angels in the form of two men who come to Sodom and Gomorrah who go to Lot's house. And you see firsthand how wicked the, the inhabitants, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah are who want to have sexual relations with these two visitors. And that was very wrong for many, many reasons and just proof positive of just how sinfully uh, these people were living and against God's word. And yet, God still worked to save Lot and his family. And he gave Lot and his family advance warning. They were able to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot's wife would have been saved too if she would not have turned back and be turned into a pillar of salt. And you see how God's love was shown for Abraham you do see that God, in fact, did grant what Abraham was asking for. It's just Abraham didn't use those exact words. Abraham's concern with Son Gomorrah's safety was first and foremost about his nephew Lot and his family. And God had saved those, that family of four from the destruction of Son Gomorrah, just as Abraham wanted, even though he didn't necessarily pray for that. 
and see this way that God, sometimes he answers our prayers in ways that we would not expect, or he works in spite of what we ask for in order to give what is best for us, to show his love for us as he knows best. When it comes to the topic of prayer and how we see what else God may do, uh, we can see there's a lot of questions wondering, what exactly is God's purpose in his answer to me? And no matter what the answer may be, whether it's in discipline or in prayer, we know that it is for our good. When we go to God and pray and ask for something, God doesn't have, he doesn't have to say yes to it. He may say no. He may say maybe later. But no matter what the answer is, it is for our eternal best. So we can be confident in that and trust in God's promise and his, uh, his will to do what is good for us in all things, even if we don't understand how that might be the case at the exact time. Let's go to another example, another time where God or godly reasons, people will say no in love. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we read, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is one of the passages that we go to in the Bible. Know that when a person confesses their sins, that is when they repent, that they are completely forgiven. All their sins, all their wrongs, all their unrighteousness is wiped away. And in God's sight is just as if they've never sinned in the first place. The fancy biblical word we use for this is justified. That a person is justified just as if I've never sinned. And that's exactly the promise that comes to us, made sure to us by the death of Jesus on the cross. And what's also true is the flip side of this. That if a person does not confess their sins, well, then God will not forgive them and their unrighteousness will not be cleansed. They will remain sinful in God's sight. And that is something that we know is a very big deal because God hates sin. And he says many times over that if a person passes away and has sin credited against them, that is sin that has not been forgiven, then they can expect to spend eternity in the suffering that hell is. And so for this reason, we certainly want all people to repent. We want all people to come to the knowledge of what is in God's word, that forgiveness. And so we see some directives that Jesus gives to us in Matthew chapter 18, where he shows to us the necessity that we have as Christians to reach out to our fellow Christian, to urge them to repent, to be forgiven, have that unrighteousness washed away. Reading in verse 15, if your brother, and brother here refers to a fellow Christian, not just in a family context. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, and treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. When it comes to saying no to our fellow believer, to our fellow brother and sister in the faith, we see how this guideline works when it comes to pointing out their sin and to say what you're doing is wrong and that we shouldn't continue in it. It starts, first of all, in a private way between the person and the one who is sinning in a private matter to go and to point out their sin, to urge them to repentance. And if they listen to you, then you've regained your brother, showing us that this idea of saying no to another is not to have a power trip or to make ourselves feel good and great, but it is to regain the other person, to bring them back into the forgiveness that Christ has won for us on the cross. However, what if they don't listen to you? What if they refuse to hear the words that you're saying? We see verse 16 where it escalates a little bit, but bring in some other people. To bring in one or two other people to show that this isn't just one person's word against another, but this is consensus. This is uh, greed thinking that what a person is doing is wrong and it should be stopped. And with the group of two or three others to point out a person's sin. If they refuse to listen to them, then you go to the next level, which is you go to the church whether that is a pastor or a minister, um, or if it's um, whatever your church home may be, go to the highest authority, the people who should know what God's word is, who act in a very public way, but in a very final way on behalf of God. And if they refuse to listen to even the church, well, then you make it clear that what they're doing is not right. 
you know, they're clearly disobeying God's word and do not want to listen to it or even uh, live by it, then treat them as such, as someone who does not want anything to do with God's word, like an unbeliever, or in first century Israel terms, a tax collector, who was a sellout uh, for many, many different reasons. I'll let you look up in a Bible dictionary or online how tax collectors were viewed in Old Testament and in the first century Roman world in the, in the nation of Israel at that time there. But this idea of certainly we need to say no to another person because if we don't point out their sins, they run the risk of remaining in that sin. And that's not going to have good consequences when it comes for eternity. And there's a case study where we see one believer calling out another person's sin. And this is found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and following from there. To give a little bit of backstory, this is the tail end part of David's account with Bathsheba. And if you're not familiar with the account of David and Bathsheba, King David is the is king of Israel around 1500 BC, one of the mightiest kings that Israel had ever known, and by and large was a very, very good believer. Um, he lived his faith and word and action. He repented, he confessed, um, and he brought glory to God in a lot of different ways. One of the best kings that Israel had ever seen in um, their entire history as a nation. However, King David was still sinful. And we see how that sin showed itself one time when he was on the top of his palace roof. And he saw Bathsheba on a nearby house who was bathing. King David liked what he saw and invited Bathsheba over to his palace. He had relations with her, and they had a child that was coming. And so King David decided that he was going to cover up this unplanned pregnancy by having Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, come back from battle. And long story short, plans did not go as King David thought. He was not able to have Uriah spend the night with his wife Bathsheba and to make Uriah think that this child was his. And so King David does a cover-up that is fit for almost any kind of soap opera, where he sends Uriah back to battle. He sends secret orders to the commander of the army so that Uriah is killed and fighting. And then King David, he takes Bathsheba into his, into his palace and marries her and cares for her as if he was one of, one of his many wives. And it seems to all accounts and purposes that King David got away with this unplanned pregnancy and murder and lying and purposely getting somebody drunk. He got away with it because it seemed that no one knew any of the wiser. However, God knew. And God was not pleased at all with what King David had done and had planned to do and kept on doing with his repeated actions. And so we see in 2 Samuel chapter 11 how God calls the prophet Nathan to confront King David, to show him the error of his ways and to say no to him in love. What I'd like you to do now is to read those verses there and answer two questions. List two reasons why you think that the prophet Nathan may have been reluctant to confront King David. And then looking at the grand scheme of things, question number two, how was God's love shown to King David? Go ahead, pause the video as you read those passages and answer those two questions. As you have considered, there's a number of reasons perhaps that Nathan could have been a little bit afraid to go after King David. We're very happy he did, and even though he had uh, God's call to him and direct incentive to do so, Nathan very likely been a little reluctant. First of all, he's going to the king of the entire country. There is no Congress, there is no Senate, there is no House of Representatives or Judicial Court that can do a checks and balances on King David. He is the law of the land and what he says go. And if Nathan gets King David mad or angry, that's not going to look good for him whatsoever. So maybe Nathan was a little bit reluctant because of the power differential. Maybe he's a little bit concerned of his livelihood. If King David wanted, he could have made Nathan's life very, very difficult uh, for personal reasons. And perhaps Nathan may have been a little bit reluctant, realizing that by making the enemy of the king, well, then maybe he's going to be uh, shipped off to some backward, backwater outpost in the nation of Israel or be demoted or lose his job. Who knows? But also, perhaps the biggest reason is Nathan knew all the wrongs that King David did, and that included orchestrating the murder of Uriah the Hittite. 
if King David was willing to kill one person to keep this a secret, what would prevent him from doing the same thing with the prophet Nathan? However, Nathan went over his reluctance and spoke to King David, confronting him with his sin and saying, no, what you're doing is wrong and you need to repent, you need to confess. And thankfully, King David listened to Nathan. He confessed of his sins and repented and came back into the forgiveness that God has for those who, who, who go, go to him in, in prayer and in, 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 in repentance. And as you wonder, how was God's love shown to King David? It was very much of that forgiveness, that repentance. If King David would have remained in this unrepentant sin, he would have been putting his eternal life in heaven at jeopardy and perhaps would have been undoing everything that God had done through him and for him. And very much God's love included that he needed to call King David to repentance through the prophet Nathan, so that, Nathan, that David could continue in the forgiveness and being a good role model of what it means to be a Christian leader or to be a Christian in the first place. And very much we give thanks to God that he said no to David and all the wrongs he had done so that King David could again receive and appreciate God's love for him. And so we look at these three reasons that God will say no, or for godly reasons. One is discipline, and we saw before, where we'll say no to train somebody else to be uh, better than they were before. Sometimes in prayer, God will say no to us, or we'll give an answer we're not expecting, as he knows best for the things that we ask for. And there's also repentance. We all do things that are wrong, and we all have reason for repentance. And sometimes it might come from an official representative of the church, could come from testimony of two or three others, or come from just a fellow believer calling us to repent, saying, no, what you're doing is wrong, and you need to confess, you need to repent, so you can receive forgiveness of that sin. And yet, there's one more category that God uses where we see he says no to us for our good in love. We see he's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 and 13, the idea gets talked about. Uh, verse 12, so let him who thinks he stands be careful that he does not fall. No testing has overtaken you except ordinary testing. But God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability. But when he tests you, you also bring about the outcome that you're able to bear it. Depending on the English version of the Bible that you are familiar with, you see a different word used for the word testing. Perhaps it's the word tempting that you see. The Bible that I had growing up used the word tempting. That verse 13 would read, no, temp no, no temptation has overtaken you except what is ordinary. And then later on, he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability, but when, he, but when you are tempted, to bring about the outcome that you're able to bear. And the reason why you see these two different words used in English is because in the original Greek, it's the same word. The word for testing and the word for tempting is the exact same in Greek. And you need to look at the surrounding words to see, is it a test or is it a temptation? In English, we use those two words differently to show who is behind the struggle that is happening. If it's a temptation, well, then it's coming from someone who is not good from the devil or his demons. Maybe it's from the sinful world tempting us to go against God's word or our own sinful flesh, our own sinful nature that wants us to do something that we know is not right, and yet we still want to do it ourselves. A temptation is trying to get us to trip up, to get us to fall, to lead us away from God and away from his word. A test, on the other hand, is when it's coming from a good one, a good purpose, from a good person and specifically from God himself, where God will allow or God will send a certain struggle into a person's life, but knowing, because he knows all things, that this will make them even stronger for it in the end. As iron sharpens iron, sometimes we need those struggles, so we grow deeper in faith and we go to God's word, so we come stronger for it in the end, and also to equip ourselves to help others in the future who are going through the same hardships. But whether it's a test or whether it's a temptation, we go through that struggle. And it's not until after the fact that we can see ourselves this a testing or, if, or if this is a temptation. And Will, I guess that when you've gone through a struggle like that, that you have asked God to help you, to get rid of that struggle so that you don't have to deal with it anymore. And if it's 
probably like some cases, the answer to that has been no. Maybe there is a chronic health issue that you struggle with. Or maybe there's a person in your life that you just cannot get rid of and it just tests you. Or maybe there is some other thing or maybe a, 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 a figure that just comes up over and over again that's always putting that same struggle to you over and over and it just will not go away. And it becomes very clear that God's answer to your prayer to get rid of that testing or that temptation has been no over and over again. Why would God say no to this? How can his love be seen in a no answer? We look to a case study of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where the apostle Paul shows to us how one such thing that he prayed for to go away, when in fact was being used for his good. Before you get into these verses, I first want to des describe a little bit what this thorn in the flesh may be. We know the apostle Paul was someone who was very blessed with a lot of blessings. He had uh, he spoke in tongues, he had revelations from God, he did miracles, he did a lot of preaching, he was responsible for hundreds of people coming to faith and not thousands of people in his own lifetime. He had a lot of really good stuff going towards him. However, there was one hardship he had, something he called a thorn in the flesh. Now we don't know exactly what this thorn in the flesh is. Um, it could be perhaps that he had bad eyesight. We know one of his letters that he himself wrote um, at least a few words at the very end. And he's writing with very large letters. Perhaps it's because his eyesight is so bad that he has to write in large letters. That could be the case. Maybe it's the case that the Apostle Paul, he wasn't the greatest speaker. Maybe he had some kind of speech impediment or um, some other kind of something that prevented him from public speaking. We know that he was a master, uh, a master author person who could write wonderful books of the Bible and delineate thoughts and bring forth all these different allusions to Old Testament. But he wasn't necessarily known as being a great speaker in his time. So maybe some kind of impediment or something there. Or maybe it was that Paul got sickly and was prone to getting sick. We see him in some of his missionary journeys from going place to place that he was in an area for a little while and then he came down with something so he would leave town and go to a different part of the a different part of the country to get better um, just like how it was here in arizona uh, at least a long time ago people would come down here if they had um, problems with their lungs problems breathing and what i've been told at least with the dry weather and having the type of vegetation here it was good for those who had troubles breathing Supposedly, ever since we had planes become commonplace, whatever allergens or other parts of the country have come on those planes here to Ameri or here here to Arizona, and now you don't see that um, uh, that stuff happening as much as before. I'll let experts have the final say about whether that is the case historically or not. But certainly, getting sick on a regular basis would be a very big thorn in the flesh if your sole job is to preach and teach and to meet people and share Christ with them. And knowing that whatever this thorn in the flesh might be indeed was something that annoyed the Apostle Paul, something he prayed to God that would go away. What I want you to do now is to read these verses from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 through 10, and answer these two questions. If you were the Apostle Paul, why would you want your thorn in the flesh to be gone? And then secondly, how did God show his love to Paul through the thorn in the flesh? Pause the video as you think of your answers to those questions. Now that you've had some time to think of what your answer might be, without looking at first question, I gave some of the answers away as I uh, summed up what thorn of flesh might be. The idea of Apostle Paul wondering how much more he could do if he was a great speaker or if he had a good eyesight or if he wasn't sickly or whatever it might be. That if, if he didn't have any, any drawbacks, anything holding him back, how much more he could do for the Lord and bring glory to his name. Or maybe you could think the Apostle Paul on a personal level, how frustrated he was. No, for yourself, if you have dealt with a chronic health issue or some kind of uh, annoyance just in your life, it just grinds on you after a while. It frustrates you and brings you down emotionally. And it has so much effect on everything you do in life and who the people you get to know. If you could get rid of this one small problem that seems to just grate on you over and over again, well, then certainly life would be much better. 
and you'd be much happier to be around, right? It makes sense that this would be taken away. But no matter what the answer may be, the Apostle Paul, he certainly wanted it to be gone. However, Paul, after I wonder, after much deliberation and probably experience after it, comes to the conclusion that it is the thorn in the flesh that indeed is a sign of God showing his love to him to prevent Paul from becoming conceited or to think that it's all about him. You see in these verses here the phrase that where God says, my grace is sufficient for you. For when you are weak, then I am strong. And when we see how much we may fail in life or how we try to do stuff, but it just doesn't work. And yet God, how God still works results through our efforts or how he still cares for us in spite of what we're not able to do. We see how God breaks the rules and defies expectations, how he stays true to his word in ways that we can never expect because that is who our God is. And specifically for Paul to keep him from being conceited, you can imagine how horrible it would have been for early Christian church if Paul, who had done all these good things at first, towards the end of his life became conceited and started leading people away from God's word. That would have been a very, very bad thing. And so perhaps God, knowing all things, knew that in order to prevent Paul from becoming conceited or to lead people away or becoming burnt out or whatever it might be, that he needed this thorn in the flesh so that he could remain committed to God and to remain dependent on him in everything he does. And we see this talk about a little bit for ourselves, how God may use such hardships in our own life to work for our eternal good so we remain true to him. Being alluded to in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Not only this, but we rejoice confidently in our sufferings. We know that suffering produces patient endurance, and patient endurance produces tested character, and tested character produces hope. And hope will not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. When we look at the hardships we go through, and if we go to God's word or go to God for help in those sufferings, we see how these sufferings indeed lead us to become stronger for it in the end. As we trace the line of thought going through these verses here, these sufferings that produce patient endurance, as we realize that our home and this are where we live in this world, that our, this world is not our home, but we're simply passing uh, travelers, that we're strangers in this world, or rather our home is where we are going to be for all eternity in heaven. And so what happens in this world, this is not all that there's going to be. There's even more coming for us in the time for eternity afterwards. To patiently endure what goes through here, to go to God for that strength. And this endurance that then leads to character. A character that is uh, shaped and formed by a faith in Christ. A character that trusts in God, that makes our character based on who God says we are, instead of who we say we are about ourselves a character that produces hope. When we speak about hope in the Bible, we mean it perhaps more as a guarantee. When we know that God has promised something, that he will do what he has said. And so when we hope for God to do what he said he's going to, we know he's going to. It's a, it's, it's, it's a guarantee. And so we have hope, the idea of we know that God will do what he has said, and he will come through in everything he has spoken for us, including working for our good making us to be his children, working through hardships and, and pleasures so we may cl become closer to him. And as long as we stay close to him in the Bible and stay close to him in his word, indeed, we see how this is happening over and over again. If you have anybody in your family who has uh, gone through a lot of life, whether it's because they lived for a while or just had a lot thrown at them in a short time, and yet remain true to God for it in the end, I encourage you to ask them, how it is that they have seen the hardships that they've gone through in life brought them closer to God or to increase their faith? Many times you'll see that they seem like battle-scarred warriors, that they have hurts, they have frustrations, that they have real uh, sufferings that they go through and heartfelt pain because of what they went through. But for many of these people, they see how they came stronger for it in the end with their faith. And while they may not wish to go through such things again, indeed, they see how God worked through those, through those hardships. So they may become stronger in that faith and grounded in the hope that God gives to us through faith in Jesus Christ. And so touching full base, 
than all this stuff is. We see there are four areas where God will say no to us in love. In discipline, so that we become better off for it. In prayer, because he knows what we truly need, what's for our good. In repentance, so we go back to him in forgiveness and receive what he has won for us on the cross. And then in temptation, so that we remain true to him in spite of hardships, or perhaps realize that we need his help if we are to make it to heaven after we finish our time here in this world. However, so far we look at what God will say no to us in love. But what about us when it comes to loving our neighbor? Why are some, what are some ways that we can say no to our neighbor in love based on the reasons why God says no to us in love? We think about this idea, it comes to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, where we hear the encouragement that for us to speak the truth in love, that sometimes we need to do what is right to speak the truth of love, uh, the, the truth of God's word, or to show what is truly what's best for them, but to do so in a way that is loving, in a way that shows that we're caring for their eternal welfare or for their life here in this world. So that it leads into continued growth in Christ and be found in him. And what I have for us following next are three scenarios, three case studies that I would like you to, to, to look it over and just think, how would you answer this? Would you say yes or no? And then why? Scenario number one goes like this. Your roommate's car is tagged by campus police once again, and the fine needs to be paid ASAP to prevent it from getting impounded, which will cost much more money. Your roommate asks you for financial assistance and a ride to campus police headquarters so they can take care of business. What would you do? Would you say yes? Would you say no? And what reasons would you say yes or no for them? Pause the video as you think of your answer and then uh, go ahead and resume it again. It was interesting hearing the answers from our students in the in-person Bible study last night, uh, and very much they were saying yes overall. Idea of um, they may not necessarily give the financial assistance, but definitely they would try to give them a ride to the police headquarters uh, to take care of it. And realizing that if your roommate's car gets impounded, well, the names can affect them, and they have to start sharing their car or do uh, day on day off kind of stuff like that. Um, however, there were a number that said no, or at least no in part, for one of these reasons down here. The idea of discipline was a big one that came up. That the reason why a person's car got tagged to the point where it's going to be impounded was because they kept on parking in the wrong area, or they refused to pay for the fines. And so it's a matter of growing up, it's a matter of being responsible, you need to take care of your business. And if you continue to purposely park where you shouldn't, or don't pay the fines that are required of you, well, then you're going to pay the price, literally, by having to pay the price of impounding, having your car free from, from being impounded. However, there's maybe another little way you could think of the idea of, of, of repentance. Assuming this person is parking where they shouldn't be parking, where it's very clear that we know that when we go against the laws of the authority figures, even campus police, that we are sinning because we're breaking the law. And perhaps it's a way of showing somebody that they need to correct their actions, that they cannot keep parking where they shouldn't be parking. Well, then maybe they should um, have, to have to pay the price as a way of showing them that this is not acceptable behavior and you need to change it. You need to uh, stop parking where you shouldn't, but also to ask for forgiveness for your repeated offenses against campus police. Um, but overall, um, mostly a yes with a couple of reasons of saying no. And of course, it depends on your roommate, how much you like them up to or not, if you want to bail them out. Another one we did have, though, was scenario number two. What would you do? Your good friend's been staying over later and later at their boy slash girlfriend's place. And one evening, you get a text from them asking you to drop off a change of clothes and their laptop so they can attend their Zoom class first thing in the morning. What would you do? Would you say yes? Would you say no? Why is it that you would say yes or no? Go ahead again and pause the video if you think of your answer to this and why you would do what you would do.
this answer had a few more no's than the previous one. Um, there were a number of people saying how they were not going to do this because, well, first of all, if they're going to text this late in the evening, maybe they're not able to leave or they're not able to drive across town. And so it's a matter of practicality, they're going to say no. Or the idea of if you are doing this, it's up to you yourself. Um, you can figure it out on your own. I'm not going to help you if you decide to do this yourself. Um, there were a couple of people saying yes, because it's your good friend. You don't want to burn a bridge necessarily. Um, but overall, the answer was more so no than yes. However, what are some reasons that you might say no based on the stuff here, on the four options here? The idea of discipline. Certainly, if somebody is not thinking about what they need for the following day, well, then they need to take that into consideration. Uh, the responsibilities they have, the commitments they have. And if they're going to miss a class, well, then they need to take steps to do it themselves. And so idea of discipline to build up their character. But I see the one for repentance being a big one here. Looking back at the reason here, um, why is it that they're staying over later and later? Why do they need a change of clothes? That implies at least that they're spending the whole night there. And very likely, and there's an, unless there's an emergency that they have to be at their friend's place over the entire night, very likely um, there's something else going on. And if the reason why they're staying late overnight is because of sinful reasons, like they're enjoying substances that they should not be enjoying or enjoying them to the extent where they lost control of, of, their, of their faculties, well, then that certainly is not a good thing. If they're spending the night with them because they're becoming very, very intimate, we know what God says very clearly about sexual relations are between a husband and wife only. And if a person is not married, well, then they should not be enjoying the gifts of marriage before they are married. Um, or maybe there's a case of um, they're just uh, losing track of time and they're just staying up overnight or uh, staying up super late. That wouldn't necessarily be a case for repentance, calling out a sin. But if it is for sinful reasons why they're staying over, well, then maybe that's one way that you can point out their sin and say, I'm not going to indulge you. I'm not going to say that what you're doing is okay. And rather, I'm going to say this is wrong. And while I can't force you to change your behavior, I certainly will not encourage it, such as not bringing you your change of clothes or not bringing your laptop, but you have to uh, make it a point of coming back or simply don't do the sinful action in the first place. And this wouldn't be a concern at all. And you can think of some other reasons for saying no for that. Um, but certainly, it's the idea of the way of showing saying no in love. You could go yes or no on that, depending on your exact answer. Let's look at a third scenario and see what we have. What would you do? On your morning commute, assuming you have in-person classes again, um, or you're just going to work, on your morning commute, you get stopped at a red light. And the homeless person is right outside your window with a sign asking for help. What would you do? Would you say yes and give something to them? Would you say no and not give something to them? And why is it that you would do those things? Again, pause the videos and think of your answer um, before continuing on. This is always an interesting case study of what do you do when you see someone in need, but you don't necessarily know the best way to help them or you're not in the position to help them. Um, especially right around here in our area of Tucson, it's not unusual to see homeless people who are out and about um, asking for help or just uh, peacefully just kind of staying on the, on, on the side of the road or in the park and just kind of minding their own business. And something that I know for many of our students who live in the Tucson area, something that you have seen, perhaps wondered for yourself, what would you do? This is a difficult one because there's so many unanswered questions. You want to do what is best for them. And perhaps you may think that if I give them money, well, they're going to use it for the wrong reason. After all, many people who are living out on the streets is not because of, simple because of they lost their place to live in but there's other reasons behind it. There are addictions that feed uh, into their behavior. And so they're not able to maintain a steady job or the money they get, they spend it on uh, temporary things instead of building up uh, income or a uh, savings so they can get into somewhere for a long term. And you know that if you give this money, you're just gonna be likely feeding an addiction or a, or, or, or a problem. Or maybe there's the case that um, you know if you give money, 
you would like to, but you want to make sure it's given in the right way. And so you may do something like a food assistant. You have a gift card to some local restaurant or a grocery store, or maybe you have leftovers in your, in, in your car, something you can give to them that way. But also sometimes too, the way that you can help with somebody is perhaps you're not in the best position for it. If someone's help they need is with mental health, with mental illness, even if you were able to talk with them and to stop your commute and get to work a whole hour late, you may not be able to do anything more than just listen. While that is helpful, it's not going to give them the lasting help, the lasting answers they need. And so this is a very tough one to do. Um, I purposely will not say whether you should say yes or should say no. Um, I definitely know if you do give um, straight up money to a homeless person to not feel guilty about it. Um, and the idea of erring on the side of, 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 of being too nice. Yes, sometimes people will use, misuse what's given to them, but at the same time too, you don't know. Maybe they will use a portion of that or all of that for what they actually need. Or maybe there's a little one that they take care of and the money you give them uh, will help out the little one. You never know. Or perhaps it will be used to fuel an addiction that you're not aware of in the first place. Or maybe you will say no because uh, you have to get to work. You have to get on, on your way there. Or you're afraid that if you um, uh, make a habit of giving away that you're going to become targeted uh, as someone who's very, very nice. And all of a sudden you have to say no over and over again. And you're just not ready to deal with that. Or maybe you say no because you want to give through an organization where you can remain anonymous. Helping organizations like a food bank or a youth education program or some other way that helps those in the homeless community, but not necessarily in an in-person way. You can go either way on this, and unless you know the person's situation and what you have on hand, it's hard to say a blanket statement, yes or no. However, one thing you certainly can do is the idea of prayer for them. You can pray for them, that God will watch over them and give them what they truly need. Maybe they just uh, will find uh, access into a program that can help them with what, what they truly need. Maybe that they're on the streets because they made a horrible decision and that they need to come to terms and realize that what they're doing has not been right or they need to stop whatever their, their problem is. And it's not if you live on the streets for a little bit that you see what the wrongs are. And you can be an um, instrument, at least, of working for God or working with on God's behalf to show them what is right, what is wrong, so they end up on it all the way through the end. But no matter what your reason for no may be, let it be in love. And if you refuse to help them, or if you do help it, um, to do it with respect, to do it in a loving way, um, in a way that you want to give what's best for them, and do what's best for them, as you know at the time. And if it turned out later on that what you did was the wrong action, well then certainly, um, you know, if you uh, repent of it, confess it, Say that you're sorry for doing what you didn't mean to do. Go to God in forgiveness and then try to learn from that so you don't repeat that action again in the future. I started off this Bible study by asking you this, love is best shown for another and what it is you do for them. And by and large, that is very true. But sometimes it's what you purposely don't do for them that love is shown. Maybe to show them the error of their ways by not indulging a sinful habit or encouraging sinful behavior. Maybe it's going to be an idea of discipline, that you say no to them um, so that they end up better for it in the end. While you may not be the person who does this, maybe God's the one who says no to what you ask for in prayer because he knows that this is not good for your eternal welfare. Or maybe there's a hardship you go through in life that God has allowed, or maybe God has even sent, um, so that you remain mindful that you need help in this world, that it's through Christ alone that you can win and gain access into heaven, and that maybe that hardship is a reminder that you need God, and you can't live in this life without him if you want to have hope, so what is to come for all eternity afterward? But no matter what it is, though, we see the same low in love indeed can be a very true thing. And when I was doing my research for the Bible today, I came across this quote that I thought was really, really cool. First in the picture, this is Albert Einstein. This is not Warren Wearsby, the person I'm quoting from. Um, but definitely, I thought Einstein was a very smart person, so I have him in the picture here. However, this, what, what Warren says is this, that truth without love is brutality, and love without truth is hypocrisy. 
And this is indeed a very, I think there's a lot of truth to that quote there. That if you know something is right, but you just say it without love, or that you know what should be done, but just brush it across somebody without taking into consideration their feelings or how they can receive it, or the time when you share the words, it can be very, very brutal. And perhaps you can end up even undoing what you mean to do. Say there's a case of somebody living in sin or doing something that is clearly against God's word and they're not aware of it. And if you just simply say to them that they're going to hell, that's probably not going to be received very nicely. If anything, they're going to write you off and not even care to listen to why it is you say these things if that thought, if, those, um, uh, if that truth is coming from a place of love. They're not going to care to listen to you at all because it came across so brutal. In fact, you may galvanize them to continue in their action all the more. But the second part is also true of that quote, that love without truth is hypocrisy. If you say that you want what is best for somebody, but purposely don't do that, then you're being a hypocrite. You want what's best for them, but you're not doing what's best for them. Instead, you're just appeasing them, or you're just placating them, doing what makes them happy. And when it comes to the long, to, to the big picture, that is not what is good for them. That's not being truly loving. And so sometimes you need to say no, to say no, to speak the truth, but to do so in a loving way. Because when you have that truth and love, you can indeed share what is for them in a loving way. Certainly we see how God did this in many times in the Old Testament and New Testament, where he said no in love, and by God's grace, those people realized what that no answer was for and listened to it. But it's also a case that we get to do ourselves. When it comes to the area of discipline or prayer or repentance or temptation or any other way, sometimes we need to say no to our neighbor because that's the best way of showing love to them at the time and place. And if you find yourself in a situation where you do need to show that tough love, to say no to your neighbor, I encourage you to do so, but also to be patient. As you know from personal experience, when you have been said no to, that you did not like that, and perhaps you lashed out the person who said no to you. But hopefully you, you came around to your senses and appreciated what they were doing for you. If you have to say no to your neighbor, to remind yourself that this might be very, very tough to do, but to stay to the course, to remain true to it, and to know that what you're doing is for their eternal welfare, for their, for their overall good. And if the Lord grants that they see how that is the case, well, then wonderful. That's great. Rejoice with them in that as you seek to share God's love for them by saying no to them as well. A couple of announcements I have for us as we close up this Bible study. I, of course, I always would love to hear back from you. We thought about this Bible study, about campus ministry, uh, things you would like to study about in the future. Easiest way of doing that is our feedback survey. Find that on our website, wellstcm.com, and you can find a lot more information about what's happening at Campus Ministry, as well as the following items. This Saturday, October 17th, we'll be having our service project, where we'll be stuffing 25 lunch bags for the staff at Banner, Ho Banner, Ho Banner Hospital, and also to uh, design a coloring book for the residents of nursing homes in the area. Lunch will be provided. You're welcome to take part in that if you want to. Um, we'll be meeting from 12, to no uh, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Welcome to stay for the entire time or just for a little bit, whatever works in your schedule. As we say thank you to the community and also to show our thanks to those who have taken care of us in the hospital system. Our next TCM Bible study will be uh, giving up for the greater good. The in-person setting will be on Sunday, October 18th at 7 p.m. As we sometimes learn that in order to love our neighbor, we need to give up of ourselves so that it's for the greater good. Giving up that may include even a sacrificial giving that hurts us to our very selves. And as usual, as with, with this video Bible study, the video version will be released uh, very, very likely on Monday, on October 19th, so you can view what we learned in our Bible study on that. Lastly, what I have for us is an online gathering hosted by Awake and Alive. Awake and Alive is a campus ministry group that's based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, but we're in connection with, uh, with Tucson Campus Ministry here. And they're going to be hosting an online Zoom gathering called Changing the Narrative to Christ. As we take every thought captive to Christ and to God's Word, 
specifically in our current day and age. That is scheduled to be happening on Sunday, October 25th at 4.30 p.m. our time. And you can find much more information on how to get into the Zoom gathering on wealthtcm.com. I thank you all very much for watching this video, for learning with me God's word, as we learn why God says no to us in love, so we may also show that same love to others by saying no to them, um, even that may not be necessarily fun or enjoyable, but indeed it's a very loving thing for us to do. Until then, I wish you all God's very richest blessings. Stay safe, stay healthy. Remember that your, your God is always blessing you. He's always with you. Goodbye, everybody.